the next technique regarding quantified and predicate statements that we're going to talk about is called instantiation. Now recall that a bound variable cannot be substituted. The technique for handling bound variables and constructing proofs around them is called instantiation and it has a sort of converse operation called generalization. So this is just a fancy word, instantiation. We are declaring a specific instance of a quantified statement, choosing a particular variable to represent a constant that we're using. So for example, if E of n means n is even, and the domain of discourse is positive integers, then there exists an n so that E of n is, uh, is true. There does exist a number which is even. If something exists, we should be able to call it by a name. This is what instantiation sort of is. If things exist, we can give them names. And there are two different versions depending on which quantifier we're using. Unsurprisingly, there's universal instantiation if we have universal quantifiers. So suppose for any x, p of x, okay, let's just pretend this is a true statement. For any x, p of x is true. Then you're allowed to write p of z for any valid term that you want. And the way we write this is universal instantiation where x has been substituted for z. We duplicate the notation for substitution, although technically it's logically it's called a different thing. This is not substitution, it's instantiation, but spiritually it's the same idea. It's not exactly a substitution though. Notice that this is a quantified statement for any x p of x, and this is not p of z. But fundamentally, if for any x p of x is true, then for this particular choice, it will remain true for any term that you could possibly put in there. So if a statement is always true, then it is true for any term that we put in. It's pretty straightforward. Just note again that you're getting rid of the quantifier. Instantiation is always a method for getting rid of quantifiers. So we can ask something if for any x p of x is true, can't you also say for any z p of z? That is a valid rule of inference, okay? But we're not introducing it as substitution. If I just substitute all the x's for z's, that's kind of what's going on here, but we're not gonna refer to it as substitution, okay? Because we don't want to introduce uh, rules when we can actually prove that they work. Okay, so once we go over the rules of instantiation and what's known as generalization, this sort of substitution will be something we can prove is allowed based on a smaller collection of rules. We don't want more rules, we want more theorems. So without worrying about this statement's meaning, for any x, p of x implies either q of a or r of x, don't worry about p, q, and r, we're just discussing logic rules here, which of the following are legitimate examples of universal instantiation. Here's a list. Which of these statements can be achieved by universal instantiation? The first one is valid. Okay, I've got a universally quantified statement, and if I replace all of the x's with anything I want, for example t, I would obtain this, dropping the quantifier. How about the second one? Still valid. Okay, we're replacing every instance of x with anything we want, even if it's the same that was being used here. Universal instantiation does not require you to use new variables. If a statement is always true, then it's true even if you're using something that was already used somewhere else. How about this third one? For every t, p of t implies q of a or r of t. That is not an example of universal instantiation because every time you do an instantiation, you drop the quantifier. How about P of B implies Q of B or R of B? No, universal instantiation does allow us to replace these X's with B's, but not this A here, okay? I'm not saying you can't get this statement. I'm just saying it's not an example of universal instantiation. If B was a new variable, in other words, did not exist anywhere else in whatever proof you were doing, what you could do is you could do a substitution on this, replace A with B, and then you could do this instantiation. But you can't get here just in one step. Also, what you couldn't do is first do 
the instantiation, P of B implies Q of A or R of B, and then the substitution, because the substitution would then be using a variable B that already exists. So even though you can get this statement, you could also get it using bad reasoning. Okay, this is going to be a recurring issue. The order in which you introduce new variables has to be very careful. Just remember, substitution can only be done on free variables and must use entirely new terms. Whereas universal instantiation is very open. So generally you're gonna to want to do your universal instantiation later because it can reuse variables and your substitutions earlier because they can't. Now let's talk about the flip side, existential instantiation. Instantiating existentially quantified statements is a bit trickier compared to the universal ones. Just because a statement is true for some choice, there exists a choice for which the statement is true, does not mean it's true for any choice. Okay, so for example, if you have the statement, there exists an x so that p of x is true, you are allowed to write p of z existentially instantiating in the following notation, but the variable z cannot exist anywhere as a free variable. The thing that you substitute in when you do existential instantiation cannot exist as a free variable anywhere. It's actually not a problem if the symbol you're using exists as a bound variable because it's sort of subservient to the quantifier that binds it, introducing it somewhere as a new free variable is not actually a problem. Uh, I still recommend against it, but it's logically allowed. So suppose you can, ex you can access all the following in a proof. You're doing a two column proof and all of these exist as lines and they've already been justified. So which of the following are going to be legitimate uses of existential instantiation? Here's our list. From any of the things above, can you get P of A and Q of A? So P of A and Q of A appears to be coming from this. Can I do an existential instantiation using the variable A? No, because A exists as a free variable in statements that are already out on the board. P of C and Q of C, however, can be written. I have an existential statement, so I can instantiate it using a new variable, and C doesn't appear anywhere else. How about P of C implies R of A or Q of D? That appears to be related to line four here. No, okay. That would require us to get rid of two quantifiers. That requires two steps. I'm not saying this can't be done. I'm simply saying it cannot be done through existential instantiation. This one also cannot be done. Line four is a universally quantified statement. For any x, some stuff happens. That means it can be used with universal instantiation, but it is not an existential statement. First and foremost, it's universally quantified. This says for any x, some stuff happens, which means it's universally quantified before anything else. So you can't use existential instantiation on line four. But what about line five? Yes. This is a existentially quantified statement, so I can do existential instantiation by replacing every x with something as long as it is something entirely new. And if we replace every x with the new variable c, that's fine. Now let's take a look at a two column proof. Okay, we're jumping right into the deep end. We've got a rule of inference, so it has some givens and a conclusion. We start by writing the givens. This hasn't changed. Okay, now let's see step by step how we can get to the desired conclusion. Well, the desired conclusion should appear last. That is also carried over from earlier techniques. Now here are a couple of steps that are gonna be done along the way. Suppose six and eight can be constructed. Q of C and P of C implies R of C. Q of C and P of C, I can use plain old fashioned modus ponens because we have a conditional statement and its hypothesis. So if I refer to the conditional statement and its hypothesis, we can use modus ponens to extract the conclusion R of C, 
the rules of inference we already know are still out there. All right, how are we gonna to get to line six and eight? Let's look at this proposed line four. P of C implies Q of C, universal instantiation on line one. Sure, I've got a universally quantified statement and I instantiate it by substituting in the variable C. Specifically, I've replaced every instance of X with C. Line five, for any Y, Q of C and P of Y implies R of Y. Where did this come from? Universal instantiation of line two, okay. This is first and foremost universal instantiation of X, so I'm replacing X with C. So we check two things. If I replace all the X's with C, I get for any Y, Q of C and P of Y implies R of Y, which is right there. So I did indeed replace every instance of X with C and drop the universal quantifier. Did I use an allowable term? Yes, remember universal instantiation is totally open. You can use any term you want, which means you can use it more than once. Now, how can I get Q of C and P of C implies R of C? I'll give you a hint, it's gonna come from this line right here. Universally instantiate the variable Y using the same variable C. I've got a universally quantified Y, drop the quantifier and replace every Y with whatever you want, and we're gonna replace it with C. And now notice that between lines three and four, we can just apply modus ponens to get out Q of C. We already had P of C as a given, so I can conjoin them. This is just standard stuff from the previous unit. And now that completes the proof. Modus ponens between lines six and eight, gives me the desired conclusion. Now let's look back at the statement. For any x, p of x implies q of x. For any x and for any y, if q of x and p of y, then r of y. p of c is true. Now for any x, p of x implies q of x, so p of c would therefore imply q of c. If you had p of c and q of c, then you would have r of c. And that's the argument that we've formalized over here. Anytime you have an X, if P is true, then Q is true. If you have a choice of X and Y so that Q and P are both true, then R must be true. C is a specific choice so that P is true. Since P is true for C, then Q is true for C. Since P and Q are both true for C, then R is true for C. But here's the two column proof. 